Hey, welcome again to another edition of NASA at Home Spaceport Series. I'm Joshua Santor, your host, traditionally coming to you from the Kennedy Space Center. But today, uh, as usual for our series, I'm coming to you live from my house. Uh, super excited today to get into talking about what's uh, still happening at the Kennedy Space Center. This beautiful rover, the Mars 2020 rover, recently named Perseverance. If you look really closely up towards the wheels on the upper right-hand side, you can actually see there's one of the bars. It's labeled with Perseverance. So there is a ton of really cool work happening right now, uh, getting Perseverance ready. They're undergoing assembly. They're getting ready to package this thing. Wheels have been installed. Parachutes have been installed. The helicopter has been installed and we are uh, charging towards a July launch. So uh, milestones happening every day, new and exciting things happening all the time. Uh, we are pumped about that. So as we progress through this series and through this episode, please feel free to send us your questions. Let us know what you'd like to see in future episodes and feel free to, and please subscribe to our channel. We'd love to have you follow us as we move on. Uh, but I do wanna go ahead and bring in our guests now. So today I am joined by two of our engineers from Mars Science Laboratory. Uh, first up, we've got Al Chen. Um, Al is the Mars 2020 uh, Entry, Descent, and Landing Phase Lead. We'll talk more about EDL in a little bit, but um, Al, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and we also have uh, Chloe Sackier, is a Mars 2020 uh, EDL, again, Entry, Descent, and Landing Systems Engineer. Um, so obviously these two folks are extremely critical to the work going on. So let me just kind of open up and say, uh, what are you what are you working on for Mars 2020? What is really EDL? Al, you want to start? Sure. The uh, entry, descent, and landing team is charged with getting the rover safely from the top of the atmosphere of Mars down to the uh, down to the ground safely. Uh, that means wheels down on the ground uh, in one piece, um, which means we have to go through a lot of things to get there. Uh, First, you know, hitting the atmosphere at, uh, at 12, 13,000 miles an hour and then ending uh, when we touch down safely at the ground uh, at about uh, one and a half miles an hour. Chloe, how about you? What's, uh, what's your role for, for Mars 2020 specifically? Systems engineer, well, what does that really mean? So like everybody else on our team, I do several different things. Primarily, I'm the uh, EDL communication systems engineer which means that I'm responsible for ensuring that our spacecraft is talking to our orbiters and that the rich set of data that we generate during EDL makes it off of our spacecraft uh, to our orbiters and then through the deep space network and ultimately back to us here at JPL so that we can reconstruct exactly what is happening during EDL and share it with the world. Uh, like many other members of my team, I'm also a member of the EDL testing team in the mission system test bed. So here we get to dry run EDL over and over and ensure that our flight software is interfacing correctly with our hardware. We essentially get to practice EDL over and over, sometimes in off nominal situations to ensure that our flight system is robust to anything that Mars might throw at it. So thinking about, uh, so kind of taking a step back for a second, looking at the big picture here. So obviously we've kind of pinged on kind of what EDL means and where what your roles are. But we're talking about launching what is essentially a small car, the size of a small car anyway. It's going to fly through space to Mars on a journey that takes, I think it's eight months to get there? It'll For be about, seven, be about and seven. Okay, so seven and a half, eight months in that time frame. Um, and so we're trying to slow down enough to land safely. Uh, so let's talk about where are we going to land? Because obviously Mars is, is not a small place. There's lots happening on Mars. Um, so where are we going? Perseverance will land at uh, Jezero Crater on Mars, uh, which Al can tell you more about how that's such a rich and interesting scientific location. Um, we're going to be touching down there on Thursday, February 18th next year, 2021. Uh, it will be about 3.30 p.m. East Coast time, 12.30 p.m. here in California. Coincidentally, it'll also be 3.30 p.m. at Jezero at local Mars time. So can you tell us, yeah. this is, what, what are we seeing in this picture? I, I know this is from the Martian surface, but what is this? Al, you want to take that? This is a delta in, in the middle of Jezero Crater. Uh, past missions have shown us uh, that uh, Mars in the past was uh, wet and habitable and had all the kind of building blocks of life. So Mars 2020 is kind of charged with taking that next step 
um, where, you know, can we find the signs of past life uh, at a place like Jezero Crater? Um, one of the reasons why we're going to Jethro Crater is, that, is what you're seeing right here uh, in this picture is a picture of the delta that we see here. You can kind of see uh, the uh, the wash where the where the water may have come into this uh, to this create this ancient delta from the west side here, um, and then deposit this delta. Um, to seek the signs of past life, we need to go to a place that uh, may have might, might have had life in the past. You know, that's kind of the first ingredient. And the second question is, can it then have been preserved or preserved over the uh, over the billions of years so that we can find the evidence of it now. Uh, so that's kind of the reason why we're going to a place like Jezero Crater. Um, but the, uh, from us, from the, from the entry, ascent, and landing perspective, uh, none of that matters if we can't land there safely. Uh, in fact, this site was considered for a curiosity, actually, on Mars Science Laboratory in the past, but rejected as being too unsafe. Uh, but now we think we have the tools to allow us to, uh, to land there. So too unsafe, I, I've got to ask that question then. Uh, if it was too unsafe for curiosity, then what gives you the confidence? And I believe that we can do it. I, obviously, you guys are the experts, you know what you're doing. Uh, so how are we so confident that we can do that today? Well, when we're looking for a land site, we have to make sure of a few things, right, that, to make sure that we can land there safely. Uh, we're trying to make sure that site isn't too high. Um, the atmosphere of Mars is really thin, and we use it to stop. Um, so if we go to a site that's really high, we have less atmosphere to use to stop, less stopping power. That's kind of the first thing we look for. Uh, the second thing we're looking for uh, is the atmosphere. We don't want to go to a place where the weather is bad, uh, where there can be a lot of wind shears or unpredictable weather. Uh, so that's something that we're also screening landing sites for. Um, and thirdly, uh, we have to make sure that the terrain itself is safe enough to land on. Uh, in the past, we've tried to make sure the places that we could land on were uh, kind of as parking lot as possible, right? We want to land in, uh, in flat, rock-free places, uh, kind of like runways, right, that, uh, that make it easy for us to put the rover right down on its wheels. Um, but while, uh, while Perseverance here uh, looks a lot like uh, Mars 20, or looks a lot like Curiosity from the outside, um, and the EDL system looks very similar, we've added a couple of things that'll help us land, uh, land safely. Chloe can probably talk through the, uh, how we get through from the top of the atmosphere to the bottom, and I'll talk a little bit about how uh, we've added a few things to uh, to make a place like Jezero possible. Yeah, Chloe, as you kind of talk through that process of kind of from the atmosphere to the, the surface there, we had a question come in on social on the chat window actually asking, um, are you tracking real-time data? Uh, what's that process like for understanding at this very moment what's happening during the EDL process? So uh, happy to hear your answer. Yeah, so first to summarize what the EDL process looks like, like Al alluded to earlier. Um, as you mentioned, we hit the atmosphere at a screaming velocity going about 5.5 to 5.6 kilometers per second, or maybe more tractable number 12 to 13,000 miles per hour. We use the atmosphere to start slowing down, protected by our heat shield, otherwise we burn up, while we're steering towards our target using uh, Apollo adapted guided entry. And then we deploy the largest supersonic planetary parachute that has ever been used. Uh, it's about 21 and a half meters in diameter and we'll deploy that at a Mach of uh, around 1.75. And then we slow down a little bit, we jettison our heat shield around Mach 0.7, uncovering the radar, which we can use to start searching for the ground. Uh, and then at that point, our descent stage drops out of the back shell, executes a divert maneuver so that it doesn't recontact the back shell and the parachute that's still attached. Then the descent stage takes us down to a velocity of only 0.75 meters per second at just about 20 meters off of the ground. And here's where we execute the sky crane maneuver that was originally debuted on Curiosity, which separates the rover from the descent stage like a rocket jet pack and touches Perseverance down safely and slowly on her wheels. And then we uh, separate the descent stage and fly it away to a safe distance. And all throughout that process, we can't really joystick it or RC it here on Earth. We can't control it at all because at that point, the one-way light time between Earth and Mars is over 10 minutes. So the best we can do is set Perseverance up to safely fly EDL all by herself. But we are receiving uh, telemetry that's real time to us throughout that whole process at Mission Control and trying to figure out what's happening. And specifically, I think the person online asked about MRO's involvement. Does that data come via MRO, um, which is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or other satellites that we have on Mars, or is it coming straight back to us? We are definitely using MRO as one of our partner orbiters to relay that data, yeah. 
cool. We had another question come in. I don't know if either of you can answer this, but curious to know if you know, uh, there was a really cool piece done for Curiosity's Landing called The Seven Minutes of Terror, kind of alluding to what you just mentioned, Chloe, the idea that we can't control it. We've just set it up for success, um, which is kind of a cool, mm -hmm. like really terrifying reality, um, hence The Seven Minutes of Terror. <laughs> Uh, are we going to have another piece like that to kind of talk about um, what's different this time around? Obviously, there's hopefully a little less terror because we've done it once really successfully. Yeah, we definitely added a, a few things here that uh, are a little bit more terrifying. I mean, certainly, the site is more challenging than we've gone to in the past. <laughs> uh, but you're right. We have a little bit more confidence from the, from the past mission, from Curiosity. And we have a lot of inheritance from that mission uh, that make us uh, confident that we're going to make it successfully. Uh, but we've added a couple of tools within entry descent landing itself to uh, to make our ride hopefully a little bit safer um, and help us land in, in kind of these gnarly places like Jezero. Um, one is a uh, range trigger. This is the uh, ability to deploy the parachute based on navigated range. Um, this helps us shrink the area that we uh, might land in. Uh, on Curiosity, we deploy the parachute based on just hitting a uh, particular navigated velocity. When you get to that velocity, deploy the parachute. In fact, Curiosity actually knew it was a little bit long of where we intended to deploy the parachute, about, about a kilometer long. From that. Um, so this time we're giving uh, Perseverance the ability to, to figure out where it is on the way in and deploy the parachute based on hitting the actual position that we want to deploy the parachute at. That helps us shrink down the area and help us fit uh, our landing ellipses into much smaller, tighter spots like Jezero. And second, uh, we've added something called terrain relative navigation. Uh, that allows us to take pictures on the way down which we kind of did on, on Curiosity. We kind of took those pictures kind of like a tourist and didn't really uh, and put together a movie, but didn't really use those in the landing process. This time on the way down, while we're under parachute, once the heat shield has come off, we'll be taking pictures of the ground and matching them up to an onboard map. Um, it's kind of like you or I, if we go out driving, right? You can kind of hold your map in your hand and take a look around and see at the different landmarks that are out there and figure out where you are. That's what we're asking Perseverance to do on the way down. Uh, so that once it figure out, figures out where it is, it can use the propulsive part of entry descent landing to fly to safe spots. What that means is we no longer need the entire area in which we could come down to be a flat and boring parking lot. We can have lots of little small parking lots nearby and have hazardous things in, uh, in, the, in the vicinity. If you go back to that picture of Jezero, you can see that uh, we're targeting the ellipse directly on the edge of that delta, which is about a 60 to 80 meter tall cliff face. Um, and it's also filled with rocks to the east and craters and other places where we don't want to drive that rover. And the only reason this is okay is because we, A, have shrunk that landing lifts to, to make it much smaller, and B, have put this terrain relative navigation system in so that we can find those little parking lots that are interspersed around these hazards. Uh, you know, there's always that tension between science and, uh, and engineering from the landing side. We want to land in as flat as boring places as possible so they're safe. Uh, but places that the scientists want to go you know, or like the Grand Canyon or like Jezero here, where we have lots of terrain and lots of rocks to look at and lots of cliff faces. Um, so we found a way to balance those things by adding some capability uh, to our entry descent landing system that originated on Curiosity and has been upgraded for Mars 2020. That's awesome. We had a question come in. Don't know if you know this, but are there 3D printed parts on um, Perseverance? There Chloe, are you... some 3D oh. printed parts uh, on Perseverance. Um, let's see if I can... I can't name some off the bat, but I know we have printed a few, though. <laughs> no, that's all right. It's a big rover. And one of the things, too, to kind of point out about 3D printing in general is that for things that are the, the machines that are more common, they print with a much more plasticky material. Uh, but there are 3D printers that have the ability to print with much greater levels of strength of composite. So we're not necessarily indicating that there's plastic pieces on there that might be as fragile as what you could do in your house. Um, there's some pretty high fidelity stuff, some things that can even include Kevlar these days. So um, pretty awesome there. But I want to ask you both, we're winding down here on time, uh, but what are your roles going to be for launch and landing? Obviously, uh, for landing, you guys have critical roles to play because that's really your bread and butter. Um, but for launch, are you just spectating or are you just enjoying that moment? I think for launch, uh, yeah, most of us will just be open in the sunshine and, and waving goodbye to uh, the thing that many of us have spent a long time on. Um, a few members of our team are working uh, some aspects of launch, but for entry, descent, and landing, like you said, our big day is uh, February 18th, 2021. So for that, um, like I mentioned earlier, there's nothing we can do really to control EDL. The days leading up to EDL are very important because we want to ensure that we've configured the spacecraft so that she can fly the safest EDL possible. So make sure that she has all the updated navigation and trajectory information that she would need. 
Um, but when it gets to the actual event, we'll all just be in the mission control rooms at JPL, monitoring that telemetry stream and sharing what we've learned with the rest of the world. Al, how about for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, kind of looking back, and I remember what I did for uh, the Curiosity launch. I think that was the last vacation I took before landing. Uh, so hopefully we'll be on vacation and get to go see the launch. Um, and then, uh, you know, back to the grindstone, make sure that uh, we do everything that's, that we can to make sure that we have a good day on February 18th. Yeah, obviously, uh, two big dates to mark there. July 17th is what we're targeting as our launch date, um, charging ahead, still on time. And then you said landing was February what? 18th. It's, uh... February 18th. Okay. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, the landing footage from Curiosity from the control room is pretty spectacular. Um, it's kind of the world championship of robotics and engineering, um, getting to see that thing um, come together. So we'll look for both of you cheering this time um, in a very excited fashion once we get confirmation that we're on the ground safely. Thanks. My hair's a lot grayer since last time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Al, Chloe, appreciate you both. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having us, Josh. Thanks, Josh. All right, so uh, we are just about out of time. Like I said, please feel free to continue to submit questions for us. Also, please let us know what you'd like to see on future episodes. Subscribe to our channel. And wanted to highlight uh, fat really quickly for you, uh, obviously there's a lot happening with NASA at home. It is a big effort of just lots of things you can do if you're at home and you need things to look at, um, really cool eBooks and videos and all sorts of other things. Uh, also be sure to check out more about Mars 2020 at mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020. And I want to uh, call attention to what is the the social media highlight of this week. No question, there's a lot going on on social media, but this is the biggest thing. We have the launch of humans from America to low Earth orbit for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttle program. Um, so uh, Bob Bednick and Doug Hurley will be flying on May 27th aboard a Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon headed to the International Space Station. Uh, so we could not be more excited for this. This is the culmination of the commercial crew program. Um, so very excited to see that happening. Uh, that's going to do it for us today. I'm Joshua Santora, usually from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, hoping to see you again later this week where we kind of recap our veggie episode. So hopefully you, you're growing your popcorn. Check out our episode on plant growth to learn more about that. Um, I'll have my popcorn ready. I'm going to reveal it live. Um, I haven't looked at it, so I'm excited to see where, it, where it's headed and where it's going. Uh, but that's all for today. Um, be safe, and remember... Even the sky isn't the limit.